Good morning, everybody. Hope you guys are having a good day. Hope everyone's uh hope everyone enjoyed their weekend, had a had a good Monday. Um and so what we are going to do today is we are going to get after a little bit of chapter four and a little bit of chapter five stuff. Now, just one moment. There we go. Um, okay, so let's see. Just to, to recap, um, last Wednesday and Thursday and yesterday on Monday, um, I did the little homework sessions. Uh-oh. Somebody got stuck in the waiting room. Um, so I've done the little homework sessions, gone over a couple of chapter four uh, problems. And I would say that the chapter four problems have kind of escalated in um, in, in the challenge associated with them. Um, so we're going to wrap up chapter four today and then get into chapter five as well. Um, if you were here yesterday, these chapter four problems are going to be very similar to what we did yesterday. But... You know, there's, I don't think that there's any harm in practicing things. Um, so we will go ahead and get started with that. Um, the first problem that I want to do is one that is very similar to, it's really questions, mm, well, it's really similar to question number 23, but if it's similar to 23, it's kind of similar to 24, 25 of your homework. Um, but question number 23 asks you to write the molecular, uh-oh, chat. No, not at all. Um, just one second. The question was, can I record? And in, everyone is free to record. I just need to approve it. Um, I, I'm not exactly sure why it's something that I have to approve. But I, I always... Uh, well, I thought it doesn't appear that you can. That's strange. Huh. Well, now it's that's peculiar, Chad. Some people have their own copyrighted lectures. I don't know what that means. I post all the lectures on our Canvas page, so you have access to them and you can download them um if you somehow profit off of them though i expect at least a 60 40 split me 60 you get the 40 percent for you know you're doing most of the legwork for actually selling it so i i'll respect that um don't want it. oh yes well for 40 percent of the profits i will i will gladly relinquish my power uh, but for some reason brandon i'm sorry i i I'm trying to go in to uh, permit you to record, but for some reason, uh, Zoom's not letting me. So I'm, I'm sorry about that. I guess I, I have to retract my yes, you can record. For some reason, it's not letting me. Uh, Anna Queen asks, where is a good spot to be in class? Starting chapter five, that's fantastic. That's a good place to be. Um, Amaya has, I don't know if that's a lobster, and then Zakora is laughing or crying. Um, Okay, that sounds good. Okay, cool. Um, well, then I'm going to close that the chat. I'm going to rearrange my desktop for a second. Okay, so question 23 asks you to write a molecular and a net ionic reaction. Now, um, it specifically says, write the balanced molecular equation and net ionic equation for the neutralization reaction between hydrochloric acid and strontium hydroxide in, or include the phase of each species. Okay, so now the way that I think about a, these different types of equations, a molecular versus a net ionic equation is the molecular equation tells you all the molecules that are reacting with one another. The net ionic is just the ions that are involved in forming a product. Now, this is a neutralization reaction. And so as a neutralization reaction, you'll sometimes hear them referred to as an acid base neutralization. So when you hear that, you should think, well, there's probably an acid and there's probably a base. 
Well, our acid was HCl, hydrochloric acid. That had an AQ by it. Then, Alexis, that's right. This is also similar to question 24. But with this one, we're going that next, or we're kind of doing a little bit more than question 24 because question 24 only asks for the molecular equation. But that's a great observation, Alexis. So we've got HCl, and then we're going to add strontium hydroxide. Now, keep in mind, you will always have a periodic table before you on any sort of test. Um, and you might see that and think strontium hydroxide. Okay, strontium, when have I talked about that? At this point in my life, I'm, I'm reaching zero points total. What you need to be able to do is you need to be able to identify strontium on the periodic table. Strontium is SR, so the symbol SR, and therefore it has, or sorry, as it is SR, it's found in group 2A of the periodic table. As a element found in group 2A, that means it has a plus two charge. Well, hydroxide. So this is strontium and it's paired up with OH. OH is a polyatomic ion with a minus one charge. So we are going to make a combination of strontium and hydroxide that is neutral. And what that's going to look like is SROH. The OH ends up in parentheses and we're going to put a subscript of two because we have to have two of those negative charges to basically cancel out the two positive charges of strontium. Okay, so I'm gonna erase my charges because I don't really need to keep track of that, but that's kind of where I, I put together my formula. So I've got a neutralization reaction of HCl and SROH2 aqueous. And these two things are going to shuffle around. And I, I mentioned this in the videos, but these have, and this is kind of the model that I use, AX plus BY. And this AQ that I'm underlining right here means that this substance dissociates in solution. So that means the hydrogen ion and the chloride ion separate. When they, it's kind of like, um, it's like when you were in junior high school and maybe one of your parents was your chaperone. You got to the dance together but then i don't know you you do not exist you separate and you are both still there but you're just sort of floating around okay so we have ax now by is the exact same thing with this aq here okay so what this means and i'm gonna write my ionic reaction as well and then i'm going to write my net ionic what this means is that I've actually got H plus plus Cl minus, and I've got Sr2 plus plus, and I'm going to put a 2, OH minus. Okay, so my A is hydrogen, my X is chloride, my B is Sr, and my Y is OH. Now, that I do that because when I have AX plus BY, I can predict my products of AY plus BX. I just reshuffled my ions. So I'm going to do the exact same thing, but now rather than shuffling A and X, I'm going to shuffle the actual elements or the actual ions there. So hydrogen is going to pair up with OH, which is going to give me HOH, also known as H2. Oh, okay. Now, what makes this kind of unique is water is one of my products. And water, this might sound a little bit weird, but water does not dissolve in water. It does not dissociate. Instead, and that's important because you're going to have a different symbol. Rather than AQ, you'd write L for liquid. Okay, so that accounts for my A and my Y there. So I'm going to scribble that out. Now my other substances, well, I've got strontium and chloride. Strontium chloride, SRCl. Well, I've got to keep in mind my charges. Strontium is 2 plus because it's in group 2A. Chloride is minus 1 because it's in group 7A. So this is 2 plus. This is minus one. Well, I have to balance these two out. So I have to have two chlorides 
in order to cancel out my charge that my strontium brought about. So my other product is SRCL2. Now SRCL2, if you look at a solubility table, you'll see that this is aqueous. So what that means is you've got strontium ions and chloride ions floating around free in solution. But I'm going to erase kind of my intermediate area here so that I can then kind of go back to focus on balancing. So this right here, where I'm drawing a little star, another star, and a smiley face, this is my molecular equation. For the test, will we have a solubility table? That's a great question, Anamika. I will provide you with any of the necessary soluble information. So what I'll say is something like hydroxides, or I'll, I'll provide you with the rule, is I will say hydroxides are always insoluble unless they are paired with a group one or group two metal. And so then you'd be able to say, oh, well, strontium, I can see that on the periodic table, that's a group two metal, therefore strontium hydroxide is aqueous. Does that make sense? Great. So I'll yeah, like I said, uh, I do not want you to go and commit the solubility table to memory because as long as you know how to read the table and understand what it says and understand the rules and the exceptions therefore to those rules, then you're gonna be in good shape. Okay, so, so for studying purposes, should we focus more on the rules rather than reading the table? That's a great question, Maria. What I would focus on, and actually, let me see if I can, um, solubility table. Um, I'm gonna do a Google image search for something like what you would see. Uh, not, okay, this is, uh, let's, that's a good one. Okay, let's see if I can open in a new tab. Let's see if I can switch my share. For some reason, my computer's being stupid and it's not allowing me to share that. Okay, um, well, let me, so to answer your question, I think that yes, it would be in your best interest to focus on the rules. And I would say that, sorry to make this difficult, but I would say that from reading the table, you're going to get the rules. Rules for solubility, yes. So what I mean by that, okay, I have the table handy if you want me to show it. Um, actually, Maria, if you could hold it up to the screen, that might be pretty helpful. Let's see if, uh, if you end up as one of the, wait just a second, I gotta stop my share. Uh, oh, it's gonna appear backwards. Okay, well, yeah, that's, okay. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to. Um, yeah, is it backwards? <laughs> it, it, it's, it's actually not backwards, but it's a little okay. bit blurry. Um, what I'll do is I'll find the timestamp in the, the video part of my lecture um, where I'll post that. Did you okay. just look that up? Yeah. And Alexis, that's a, a great question. Um, you can really, you can just kind of Google image search um solubility rules or solubility table and that's going to pretty much give you what you're looking for um but there is a, there is a little bit of a not necessarily a trick but there's a little bit of a a learning curve to understanding it because i was looking at it with one of my nephews the other day he's in, uh, taking general chemistry and i said this you might look at it and be like oh a reference table I don't need to focus on learning or anything like that because I've got that reference table whenever my exam rolls around, but it kind of looks like, oh, what am I looking at? And so there's like, you have to be able to kind of break it down because it doesn't explicitly say every single compound. Instead, it will say like a nitrate containing compound. So then you have to think, okay, do I know what a nitrate is? Nitrate is NO3. So it will say nitrate containing compounds soluble. So then you'd have to say, okay, NO3. If I see anything paired up with NO3, then it's going to be soluble. Hydroxides on the other hand, well, hydroxides, this table will tell me, look for something with a hydroxide. Well, what's my rule? My rule is basically every single hydroxide containing compound is insoluble. So 
like I said, I'll find the timestamp on the video or video lecture, or I'll, I'll post another little video lecture where I kind of dissect it a little bit. Uh, but these are great questions, y'all. So thank you very much. Um, okay, so. They, um, yes. sorry, they gave a link when you were doing the homework for the solubility table, and I have it on the side, but I don't know if I can share it with you through the chat. You're welcome to add it to the chat. Um, okay. But for some reason, I've, I, I, I guess I'm too smart for my computer because it's <laughs> reverted to this weird way where I can only share my screen of like one thing. Um, so I, I'll, I'll just bring it back up later and, and talk to y'all about it in another video or something like that. Okay. Okay. Sure. Great. Thank you. Okay. So what we want to do is, is balance our molecular equation. Um, but effectively we've got, Let's see, we've got hydrogen, we've got chloride, we've got strontium, we've got two hydroxides as all of our reactants. Now, one of the things that we observed was we saw one hydrogen and one OH pair up to make H2O. So we have two hydrogens, one oxygen, so we don't really see hydroxide in the exact same way that we previously did. Now, the other things though, strontium and chloride, well, those two have paired up to form a soluble ionic compound and that is strontium chloride. So the good thing about balancing um, ionic reactions, neutralization reactions, is it generally does not take that much, um, it doesn't take that algebraic approach. So it's a lot faster. So basically what you need to do is you need to identify an ion that is not hydrogen or oxygen. And so what I'm going to do is I'm gonna look and I'm gonna see, well, here's chloride. There's one on the reactant side and lo and behold, here's two on the, on the product side. So how would I balance those two chlorides? Boo, whoop, two. Okay, so I put that two coefficient in front of HCl. I balance my chlorines. Awesome. Pat on the back. Okay. Do I need to worry about good? One other person participated in the 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 the, the class patting on ourselves ourselves on the back. Um, so we've got our chlorides balanced. The other non-hydrogen or oxygen ion was strontium. Strontium is balanced. Great. So that leaves us with hydrogen and oxygen. We did not start with hydrogen and oxygen, but we did kind of look at it and we knew that they weren't gonna be balanced. So let's take a look. Now we've got two hydrogen, we've got two more hydrogen, and then we've got two oxygen, okay? So grand total hydrogens on the reactant side is going to be four, okay? We've got one oxygen. And so then let's look at our product side. On our product side, we've got, well, two hydrogen and one oxygen. Hmm. Well, we have almost the perfect ratio because if we put a two in front of this H2O, now all of a sudden we've balanced two hydrogen or we balanced our hydrogen and our oxygen. So we didn't even really have to worry about, you know, getting that algebraic method out or anything like that. We started with what are our ions that are not hydrogen and oxygen? Because as soon as those were balanced, we actually basically set the dominoes in motion to balance everything else out. Does that make sense? Okay, so the next part of this, which I'm going to put a, let's put a, a circle um, and let's put a frowny face. The reason I'm putting a frowny face is this is not actually a part of this question. So effectively what this is, is this is, this is extra work. So that's why I put the frowny face and I'm getting frowny faces in the video response. But I want to include this just so we can show the process. Okay, so you might be thinking, oh, awesome. Another process, this is wonderful. But what we wanna do here is we wanna take our coefficients 
and make sure that those are included in our ionic equation. For instance, I wrote out hydrogen ions and chloride ions. After I balanced my molecular equation, I realized that I needed two hydrogen and two chlorine. So I'm going to take that two and put it here and put it here. Now, I previously put a two in front of this OH. The reason for that is I wanted to show when that SROH2, hey buddy, when that SROH2 gets into solution, it's one strontium per two hydroxides. So I've got that ratio and I'm expressing that ratio right here. Does that sound good? Okay. Now the next thing that I want to do, so I've got all my reactants balanced there, or I've got all my reactant co uh, reactants uh, enumerated. I don't know if I use that word right, but I like to use that word because I feel smarter. Anyway, my products. Okay, what are my products? Well, one, I've got to put a two out in front of H2O. Now I didn't separate that because does water dissolve in water? No, it's H2O. So I'm going to put an L out in front of that. Now, strontium chloride, that dissociates. That dissociates into SR. I'm going to put my 2 plus to indicate my charge. Then it also dissociates into 2Cl minus. So SrCl2 dissociates, just as SrOH2 dissociates. Now, when you look at strontium uh, actually now let's let's just jump right ahead and i'll come back okay so our net ionic equation is going to be the only things that well matter and this chemical reaction we're trying to make h2o we made two molecules of h2o and how did we do that we had two hydrogen ions and two chloride ions i need to put my my states here, I need to put AQ next to hydrogen and I need to put AQ next to chlorine. Now, I didn't include, or wait, not A, ugh. sorry, OH, forgot, I made a mistake there. Okay, my net ionic equation is 2H plus and 2OH. And my one product listed is 2H2O. Why didn't I include strontium? And why didn't I include chlorine? Well, let's see. What did strontium look like in the uh, reactant side? Well, it was a free ion. It was a free ion before the reaction. It's a free ion after the reaction. Chlorine. Free ion, free ion. So effectively, and the term for this is these are spectator ions. And so it's almost, I always think about it as like a, a sporting event of sorts in that these spectators, they were in the stands. They did not contribute at all to the outcome of the reaction. They did not contribute at all to the outcome of the reaction. And I fully understand. I got my graduate degree at Texas A&M. And to say that the spectators do not contribute completely to the outcome of the game is absolute, like, I'm a traitor to Aggieland. So, you know, the 12th man and everything like that. So, Alexis, basically, if it repeats. Exactly, Alexis. Perfect. Okay. So that's question number, effectively question number 23. Like I said, though, the molecular, buddy, the molecular versus the net ionic reaction. That's all that this question was asking for. And I went ahead and I balanced the net ionic reaction um, just because, well, I'm not going to lose any sleep over that or anything like that. Um, but in the event that this marks you, like, What's one thing that's common amongst all of these is that two coefficient. So you could get rid of that coefficient in front of all of them, and it's the exact same thing. Does that make sense? Because it's the lowest common denominator there. Okay, 
Now, the next question that I wanted to get after was question number hmm, question number 28. I'm going to clear my drawing and take a drink of my coffee. So this question asks us for oxidation numbers. And this is something that always kind of frustrates people and kind of like, I don't know, blows their mind a little bit. And the question that I'm looking at tells me, um, let's see, sorry, just a second. Okay, so the question that I'm given is what is the oxidation state of each element in MnNO32? Sorry, just one moment. Um, what is the oxidation state? What's the charge on each of the different um, atoms that is given in a particular formula? And the formula that I'm given is MnNO3 with a subscript of two. Okay. Now, this is a ionic compound known as manganese nitrate. In order to answer this question, you have to have a little bit of prior knowledge. If you look at the periodic table, one thing that you'll recognize is manganese is in, let's see, here's my, my periodic table. Manganese is a metal, and manganese is approximately right there-ish. Okay, now manganese being right there is in a group known as the transition metals. Now, what's kind of crazy about transition metals is they can have a couple of different oxidation states. And what I mean by that is they could have different charges. For instance, group one, G1A, those are going to form plus one ions. Group two A, well, those are plus two ions. And then you see some other trends like group seven are minus one and group six are minus two. These transition metals, you don't necessarily have that same sort of trend. So manganese, for instance, MN could be plus one. It could be plus two. It could be plus three. So you're kind of scattered in that you can't really use manganese to determine well, or sorry, you can't use its placement on the periodic table to determine what its charge is. So what you have to do is you have to say, okay, well, since I can't use manganese on the periodic table to determine its charge, I've got to use something else. And so in that case, what you would do, or in that, or what we're going to do is we're going to say, well, what is the charge of nitrate. Nitrate is a minus one ion. Okay. Now, how many nitrates are there? And this is the way that that's just something that kind of is something that you would want to commit to memory. Um, there are a couple of different polyatomic ions that I asked you to be familiar with. Um, nitrates are one of them. Um, I didn't ask you to under, or know the entire list of polyatomic ions, um, but I'll, if it's not one of the like three or four, so I asked for nitrates, sulfates, and phosphate. Nitrate is minus one, sulfate is minus two. Here, I'll, I'll just write them out. NO3 minus, SO4 two minus, and PO4, 
three minus. So if you, again, this is my dumb joke that I make all the time. If you're looking for a tattoo design, those three might be good ones. Um, I don't know about those like UV glow in the dark tattoos because that it will be kind of suspicious during a test. Like, hey, Dr. Gray, would you mind giving a UV light? Just like having them on. Um, so anyway, if you get these three will be important ones to know. So if you know those three, that's a good place to be. Um, okay, so you would be able to identify nitrate as minus one. NO3 is minus one. How many of them do we have? Two. So effectively what that means is we've got, I'm gonna say MN, and then I'm just gonna use minus one subscript of two. So if I showed you that, what would you tell me the charge of manganese is? I see two, or maybe it's just a promotion of peace. Um, exactly, plus two. Because one of the things that I always want you to be able to do is whenever you look at a formula, look in the upper right-hand corner, because that's where a charge will be indicated. If you see no number or no symbol, like you don't see a negative or a positive or anything there, you can say, okay, that's a neutral compound. So we're looking at this and we see, well, manganese and nitrate. There's two nitrate, therefore manganese is plus two. Does that make sense? Great. Now, we also need to figure out the charge for nitrogen and oxygen. Okay. Now, how do we do that? That's a little bit trickier because of the fact that nitrate or nitrogen and oxygen are both nonmetals. Now, if you look on the periodic table, one of the things that you'll see is you'll see that, um, Oxygen is in group six. Nitrogen is in group or group six A. Nitrogen is in group five A. Okay. Now, like I was saying earlier about the trends, the trends don't meet up or match up perfectly. Like group seven A, those are almost all minus one. Group six A are almost all minus two. Group five A, where nitrogen is that those are mostly minus three, but not always. What I mean by that, and what I want you to take away from that is I want you to take away that nitrogen it being in group um, 6A, you can say that's a minus two ion. So what that means effectively is you have nitrogen plus three times minus two because we have three oxygens, each of them with a minus two charge. I got a couple looks on the, the Zoom that were like, did you just switch classes? Um, so we have the charge of nitrogen plus three times the charge of oxygen, which is minus two, and that is all equal to minus one. And we know that it's minus one because NO3 minus one. So if we have that, can anyone tell me what is the charge of nitrogen? That This is great. This is one of the things that I like about Zoom. Everyone thinks that they're being very secretive when they either go like this or offering the answer like this so that if they're wrong, they're like, no, I wasn't raising my hand. That was, I just have this, this thing with my arm. Plus five is correct. So the charge on nitrogen is plus five. The charge on oxygen, you want to indicate each of those ions. The charge of oxygen is minus two. There are three of them so that they will combine to give like an overall negative six charge. But the question is asking about what's the charge of each one of these ions. Now, does that make sense? Okay, so 
why isn't nitrogen minus three? That's a great question. The reason is that nitrogen is able to, and we'll get into this more whenever um, we start talking about atomic structure. Um, but basically the way that it, it shakes out is that nitrogen is dynamic in that it can gain some electrons or it can lose some electrons. If it loses electrons, then it gets more positive. If it gains more electrons, it gets more negative. So to answer your question of why is it at negative three? Well, it's because it's dynamic, because it, it it's capable of being a positive five. And then in another case, being a minus three. And then in another case, being a zero. So I would say that the closer that an element is to the sides of the periodic table, like group one and group two, or group seven and group six, the closer they are to the, the extremes of the periodic table, the less likely that it is to change, or the less likely it is to have multiple oxidation states. Okay. Wait, I have another question. Go for it, Alexis. Um, so why isn't it not minus five? Because like, if you do the math, it's like negative five. So I'm confused on that. So the way that I always set it up is I just say N plus, and then three times that would be negative six equals negative one. And so then I'll add six over here plus six. So N equals um, plus five. So that's how I set it up there. Okay, I know the answer you got right about it, but how did you set up the equation? Okay, PEMDAS. Okay, so what I always do is I just try to, let me think, let me erase some stuff real quick. Uh, la, 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 la. Actually, what we could do is just we'll look at that SO4 ion, SO4 two minus. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say the charge of S plus the charge of four of oxygen is equal to minus two. Does everyone agree with that? Okay. So what I'll do is I'm going to above this write in four and then in parentheses, what's my charge for oxygen? Oxygen, I can comfortably say is minus two. The overall charge for this is minus two. So then my S is what I need to know. And I'm really not good at writing S's versus fives. I have poor handwriting, despite Mrs. Jones's best efforts in first grade. Um, I persevered and kept my bad handwriting. So now I've got S plus negative eight equals negative two plus negative eight Wait, no, just a second. Oh man, now I look like a fool. That's my just a second. So I'm going to say S minus eight. So subtract from each side. So then I will, yeah, minus minus negative eight. There we go. Minus negative eight. So that's effectively negative two. S equals negative two plus eight. Therefore, my S is equal to positive six. Because I try to think about it as like, what's the, the magnitude of each one of them? One's going to be positive, one's going to be negative. I have an overall charge of minus two. So that's kind of how I, I do that sort of thing. Does that help? Or did my example, okay, I'm just gonna stop talking about that. So it's an overall charge of negative two because it, cause the, um, the ion charge is what, negative two? Yes, yes. So those three ions that I wrote, the, the nitrate, sulfate and phosphate, those are good ones to just like keep in your brain because those will surface on tests and stuff. All right, well then I'm gonna clear all drawings then I'm going to go <laughs> hmm. 
just a second on homework. Um, let's see. Okay, so when it comes to... Hmm, This is going to be a little bit more of a discussion of, of concepts. Um, so chapter five is a fairly tricky one because we're getting into stoichiometry. Um, and the way that this one is illustrated and people try to illustrate it is they, the, they always use an example that they think is very relatable. Um, and everyone immediately is like, okay, well, I have to take a little bit of a logical leap to get on the same page as you because the example is like, hey, think about when you make a cheese sandwich. Everyone likes a cheese sandwich, don't they? And everyone's response is like, not really. I mean, is there anything else on this cheese sandwich? No. But everyone likes a cheese sandwich, so we've given it that much thought. Stoichiometry is all about ratios. So ratios of reactants to one another as well as reactants to products. So people like to use the cheese sandwich analogy because then they can say, oh, well, what does a cheese sandwich consist of? It's the simplest sandwich you can ever think of. Well, it's got two pieces of bread and one piece of cheese. Doesn't that sound appetizing? It's all you need to know. Cheese sandwich. You can't even go with like, a bologna sandwich or a bologna and cheese sandwich. Anyway, so these are our two reactants. We've got a reactant of bread and we've got a reactant of cheese. And our product is one sandy. Okay, so we have our coefficients. Two pieces of bread and one piece of cheese equals one sandy. So then what happens if you have 35 pieces of bread and one piece of cheese? How many sandies are you going to make? Just one. Because you have a ratio of your reactants to one another the bread and the cheese in a two to one ratio. And when you have that proper two to one ratio, you're going to make one product. Okay. Now when something throws that ratio off, for instance, when you're introduced to 35 pieces of bread, but you have only one piece of cheese, well, that one piece of cheese is going to be your limiting factor, your limiting reagent. So, we have these terms where we talk about excess reagents or reactants and a limiting reactant. Because what this is saying is this is kind of our I'll write it as, this is our, our golden rule, our recipe of sorts. So you have a perfect ratio that's going to give you one perfectly mediocre sandwich. Now, when you have more than one of those reactants than what is shown in your perfect ratio, does that change your reaction? No, it does not. That's just saying, here is your supply. Okay. Now you still have to apply those numbers to your perfect ratio. Does that make sense? 
So this is where there's kind of a, there's a little bit of a leap when you go from this to a balanced chemical reaction. Now, to illustrate this, the way that I first like to think about it is I like to keep it, well, a little bit in the same same kind of uh, mindset where I'll talk about, uh, let's see. There we go. Um, where I, I like to talk about it in terms of a balanced chemical reaction. And that's, the balanced chemical reaction is effectively like your golden rule. That's your recipe. Now, our balanced chemical reaction that we're going to look at is CH4 plus O2 yields CO2 plus H2O. Now, when this is balanced, you have a two coefficient in front of the oxygen and a two coefficient in front of the water. So your ratio for this reaction, just looking at the reactants, is you have one slice of CH4 and you have two slices of O2. You put those together and then you make, well, you actually make two different products. You make one CO2 and two H2O. So it's easier said than done, but try to apply that logic to this balanced chemical reaction and any balanced chemical reaction. So now let's think about this as you have, hypothetically, you've got 50 molecules of CH4. Now to pivot a little bit, if you wanted to react all 50 of those molecules of CH4 with O2, how many molecules of O2 do you need? That was, that was amazing. I, that was, I, I saw this motion, which this communicated this followed by that, that, that was like zero and then another zero. So perfect. I would have done this. The one, my finger, and then my eyes being the zeros. So we need 100 molecules of O2 to react perfectly with 50 molecules of CH4. Does that make sense? Okay. So we have a perfect, so this, I'm going to go ahead and anytime you get a balanced chemical reaction, I always put that in a box basically and say, that's what I care about. That's my perfect ratio. One molecule of CH4 reacts with two molecules of O2. Okay. So it's a one to two ratio. Now, if I have 50 molecules of CH4, now I'm asking myself, how many molecules of O2 do I need? Before we jump to 50, though, let's think about our rule here. If I have one molecule of CH4, how many molecules of O2 do I need? What does the balanced chemical reaction tell me that I need? Two. I need two molecules of O2. Okay. Now, let's jump up. Let's say that you have two molecules of CH4. How many molecules of O2 do you need? Four. If you had six molecules of CH4, how many molecules of O2 do you need? Perfect, 12. So it's a one to two ratio. That's the perfect balance of these two. So now, curveball here, we've got 500 molecules of CH4. How many molecules of O2 do we need to fit that perfect ratio? 1,000, perfect. So looking at that 500 to 1,000 and that 50 to 100, that ratio still fits in that one to two kind of, uh, that it still fits in that one to two ratio that we got from our balanced chemical reaction. 
Does that make sense? So that's why when we talk about stoichiometry, we look at what is the ratio of our reactants to one another? Because that's going to be very important when you ask yourself, well, if I have this, how much of this do I need? And that's part of the battle or that's part of the, the process. Maybe not battle, that's dramatic. Part of the process. You know how much of one substance you have, how much of the other substance do you need? So once you get those two, the, the amounts of your reactants in sync with one another, then you can start changing questions a little bit. Okay, so I'm going to erase this right here. Now, there are a couple of ways that these questions, you're going to see these questions. You're going to see questions that ask, if you have 32 molecules of CH4, how many molecules of O2 do you need? So a question would be, um, or a question stem would be, how much do you need? And the idea with that question is in order to consume all of both of them to get them to match up perfectly, how much do you need? That's kind of the question there. Okay. You will also see questions that say you have 32 molecules of CH4 and 99 molecules of O2. Okay. So this question, well, it kind of asks you to think about the first question. But then it asks you, well, which reactant is in excess? And so effectively that's saying, well, which reactant of the two reactants do you have too much of? So... That's why I say you would look back at that first question. How much do you need? And you'd say, okay, well, if I have 32 molecules of CH4, I only need, well, two times as many. So 64 molecules of O2. I have more than 64 though. So I have 99 molecules of O2. So I would say that is my excess reactant. Now, what I think is really helpful for this sort of question is to think about a chemical reaction or kind of a recipe of sorts that you see, not necessarily in your everyday life, but you see ratios all the time. So sometimes the problem gives you the number. Exactly. Sometimes you'll be given the number of molecules for both of them and asked which one is in excess. So the way that I think about this is I try to think about ratios beyond albeit the perfect ratio of a discussion of a cheese sandwich, I think about cars. For one complete car, and I, sorry, I, I have a minivan. Um, so for one complete Honda Odyssey, how many wheels do you need? Four. If you have 36 wheels and one Honda Odyssey body, how many complete Honda Odysseys can you make? One. So I have that one to four ratio. So my product is that one complete Honda Odyssey. If you've never driven an Odyssey, don't worry, you're young, you'll live soon enough. Um, it's amazing. It's the best thing on earth. It has, it's, it's got doors on both sides that slide open. So, you know, I could jump straight through. At any rate, that's where I'd like to stop today. I want you to be thinking about ratios, perfect ratios like that, that one to two. Okay, so here's a balanced chemical reaction. We haven't gotten into products yet. We'll get into that. But think about what's the balance that you need among individual reactants with one another. Okay? And if you're thinking right now, I'm frustrated. Well, I personally have just been talking at you for 54 minutes and you might be like, I'm tired of his dumb jokes, tired of his dumb face. I just want to get on with my life. Well, I'll be back. I'll be doing practice problems again tomorrow. And like always, that's not a mandatory uh, or that's not a requirement. I'll record that post it our canvas page. Um, and in addition to that, this is not a super simple 
thing to understand. This is kind of like you 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 feel like you get it, and then you see a problem, and you're like, oh crap. So this does take restarting and rechecking and everything like that. But you guys are smart. We'll get there. Deal. Okay, I'm gonna stop my share. Hope you all have a wonderful afternoon, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Sure so thing, y'all. Number six over um, chapter five. It will be the end. That's a great question. Chapter or quiz six will be kind of the end of like giving give or uh, some oxidation question numbers, and then maybe here's like two or three examples of limiting reactants. Not hardcore on them. But like, here's some examples, which is the excess reagent, which is the limiting reagent. So it will be like, it's towing your, towing your, your towing the water. That's what the phrase is. I was going to, you know, you just dip your toe into the water before you jump into the pool uh, sort of thing. Have a great day. You as well. Hey, bud. Y'all have a great afternoon.